Welcome to The Daily Exchange. Today we're speaking with Yen Weng Fen, the co-founder of Perpetual Protocol. Welcome to the show, Yen Weng. Hi, thanks for having me. Hi, everyone. Uh, so Perpetual Protocol, for those that don't know, it's an Ethereum-based DeFi service and it lets users trade perpetual contracts. Uh, thanks to a bit of blockchain magic in the background, it, users are able to trade up to 10 times leverage with deep liquidity and low slippage. So we'll have a bit more on that later. Uh, you can think of it almost as a decentralized version of BitMEX or Binance Futures. It's kind of like Uniswap for futures traders. Uh, but better than that, it runs on XDAI, which is an Ethereum layer 2 technology. And this means that you can trade without paying any gas fees whatsoever. And so anyone who has used Ethereum recently will know what a big deal that is. Uh, I personally have lost a lot of money to gas fees lately. Uh, currently, Perpetual Protocol supports 20 cryptocurrency pairs, which are traded against the USDC stablecoin. And that includes off-chain assets or assets from other blockchains like Bitcoin and Polkadot. And the team plans to add non-cryptocurrency assets in the future, things like gold, oil, that sort of stuff. And of course, there is a token. The ecosystem is supported by the PERP token, which can be staked in reward for a cut of the trading fees. And those fees are paid out both in PERP tokens as well as USDC stablecoins, which is a nice uh, sort of take on things. And there's no risk of impermanent loss uh, for PERP stakers, which again is another big one for me personally. Uh, so Yen Wen, let, let's jump into it. Uh, that, that's my attempt at explaining what Perpetual Protocol is, but in your words, would you just be able to explain Perpetual Protocol and explain what sort of need it fills in the market? Yeah, sure. Um, actually, I think your description is like 100% right. I mean, that's definitely like describe what Perpetual Protocol is. Uh, but in my own way, I think um, so the Perpetual Protocol is a like decentralized derivative protocols uh, I think the main reason that people want to use it is that because we provide leverage. So the same as you want to trade on like BMAX because you want to take leverage that uh, it will be like more capital efficient for the traders. So I think that's definitely the main reason. Uh, I think the difference that the uh, um, perpetual protocol itself or like what we provide is uh, we actually have a very interesting design of the, the virtual a and that uh, we actually provide even more capital efficient to the traders. That's one thing. The second thing is that, uh, like you said, we can actually trade off-chain off asset like Bitcoin, like, uh, like Polkadot, or maybe like um, you know, um, uh, the, the euros or like other, I mean, anything that uh, have uh, an index we can actually trade on that, uh, I mean, on that index. And so it, even like a group of like DeFi tokens, we can do that as well. Just uh, stop you there, just to clarify something. Um, with those off-chain assets, are these synthetic assets now? So it's like a synthetic version of Bitcoin, or is this an actual cross-chain swap? It's not a, a synthetic asset. It's, it, okay, it's a synthetic asset. It's not a swap. Uh, but uh, I mean, trading on I mean, the, the design of perpetual contract is that uh, you don't really generate that the asset. Yeah. You trade on the price, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Good, uh, good point. Good point. <laughs> so let's uh, talk more about this virtual automated market maker. So normally, a automated market maker it was introduced by Uniswap. It's your classic liquidity pool uh, where people provide. Uh, liquidity to both sides of the trade, say an Ethereum and USDC pair. And so you keep them sort of balanced and people trade in and out of the pool. Now, that's a normal AMM. Uh, your, uh, your protocol, Perpetual Protocol, uses a virtual AMM. Can you tell us what the difference is and explain why you've uh, made that choice and why it's better? I would not say this is better because it actually is in this different needs. But uh... For the virtual AM that we provide, actually, I think the goal is that we want to add leverage. So you can think of that, the, I mean, like the traditional, uh, like you said, the traditional uh, Uniswap AM, 
people provide liquidity on both sides, ETH, USDC, and then you have that pair, you provide the liquidity provider can provide the liquidity. But in our system, it, it kind of works at that way, but we actually take the collateral or margin from the trader, we then mint virtual asset. And virtual asset, I mean like virtual ETH and virtual USDC. So it kind of like this is the asset that we control. So it's, uh, you know, we can mint as many as we want, as long as we have enough collateral. So we then put this virtual asset into the Uniswap pool. I mean, like we have our own like, um, um, our own contract like Uniswap, but uh, just like, so the pool will be like virtual ETH and then virtual USDC. Okay. So, um, so because I mean, uh, so we actually kind of like, uh, it, it kind of like have a, kind of a disconnect between the collateral and virtual asset. So like leverage, so people put in like 100 USDC, we can actually mint like $500 worth of virtual ETH and then put it into a pool. So the trader actually get leverage. So that's actually the goal. Yeah. Yeah. The, yeah. So, and the other th way to think about this is how about we quickly provide it? Because we, I mean, like, because we put in a virtual asset, so the equity provider actually, I mean, like, actually we can mean as many, not as many as we want, but we can mean a lot of virtual asset to provide liquidity. So we can actually pre-see the pool with virtual asset. Only if we can we, we can have a mechanism and try to make sure that the, you know, the trader always get, I mean, the, the profit or loss in the co correct way. So in our system, we don't need equity provider. We mean the virtual token we put there. So we, I mean, kind of like the system provide the liquidity on its, on its own. Yeah, because like you mentioned earlier, for a futures contract, you don't need the underlying asset because you're just speculating on the price of that asset. Yeah. Uh, but when it comes to paying out, um, let's say someone takes out 10x leverage on a rather large trade, and they're successful, how then do you convert these virtual assets into real assets to pay out the, uh, the trader? Yeah, that's a good question. So we have an accounting system that uh, actually try to check everyone's you know, margin, how much margin they put in, how much profit they have. So, I mean, because the, we are using the Uniswap SYK because SYK is path independent we actually can make sure that the older trader who trades on the SYK model can get their profit or loss. I mean, like, um, you know, they, there is no extra profit or loss on the AM itself. So the AM doesn't really participate in the market. Yeah, it's a bit tricky. I mean, like, uh, it's, uh, it's more like um, kind of like mass magically that uh, it works. But uh, I think that's actually why we want to use the virtual AM because we can kind of like provide the version, I mean like a, a very efficient like a system from the liquidity providing point of view. And at the same time, we can make sure all the trader actually can get their payout. They, I mean like the AM or like, there's no AM, no LP. So nobody is actually having the implement loss or any other kinds of loss in the system. Only the trader is itself. And if that's the case, does that mean that there's a sort of a cap on what an individual trader um, can trade then? Uh, because like you're talking about that curve, um, because I'm, is there sort of a cap to stop them sort of exceeding what the amount of capital that they've already staked and risked uh, can then pay out? There's no cap, uh, but there is slippage. So if you want to have a kind of a larger order, you, can, you still need to take care of the slippage. Um, I mean, um, so if you want to place like, um, you know, like a uh, hundred thousand, I mean, worth of ETH, I mean, the, the order, then, I mean, the slippage might be larger so, and then you're placing like a thousand, I mean, USD worth of order. So uh, definitely slippage limit the, I mean, the kind of like, it's not like a cap, but it definitely limit the buying power of the traders. But uh, we don't really have that, uh, uh, I mean, cap. Yeah. Per user. Yeah. 
Uh, I, I think the uh, the maths at this point is beyond me. So thank you very much for, for explaining. I do understand the difference now, though, between a virtual AMM and your standard yeah. uh, type of one. So that's excellent. Uh, so what tokens uh, are actually traded on Perpetual Protocol and what are you planning to, to introduce and how do new tokens get added? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, right now we have like 20 pairs, like, including like the BTC, uh, Bitcoin and uh, I think a lot of like DeFi blue chip tokens. Uh, I think we actually are doing pretty well on like some of the DeFi blue chip tokens. So, um, um, so that's uh, that's what we have right now, and uh, we have a governance voting process. That uh, if anyone like interested in any, I mean, asset, you know, you can just go to our forum. You just like launch a post. If I mean more, I mean like uh, they are like uh, people from the community agree with that, and then we will launch a vote. Once it passed, we will. I mean, the team will set that set up that market and launch that market. And is that governed by PERP token holders or is it governed by you and your team? Uh, the token holders. Cool. So it's just classic sort of on-chain governance that decides what gets added. Yeah, it's just like Aave or like the compound, they do the votes to launch new asset. And I, I feel like we've touched on it, but just to drive it home for the audience, why would you use a decentralized service like Perpetual Protocol to trade uh, futures contracts over a centralized service like Binance or BitMEX? I think mostly, I mean, at least for myself, I think uh, control your own money. I mean, um, you want to have that freedom that, um, you know, you, you don't want to have like a, a third party, I mean, control your asset. I think that's definitely something that uh, interests people. Uh, so compared to like centralized exchange, I think this is definitely something we, I mean, we, uh, it's not provided by us, it's provided by the blockchain, by Ethereum, um, I mean, blockchain. So I think that's definitely something. The second thing is that um, because this is an AAM, so you can actually, I mean, like participate, you can launch your own market. I mean, we, I mean, on central exchange, what they have their rules to launch your market. Mostly because they feel that you know this market will be you know is will be they will be profitable on this market. I think that's the main reason. But for us, I mean, like uh, it's actually just a piece of code. So once you, I mean, like anyone can launch a vote. Um, of course, with certain criteria. But uh, once the vote pass, we actually, I mean, I'm I'm not have a pull post any tokens or any market. I mean the team. So we just launch like whatever the token holder wants. So I think that's also another reason that you might want to trade here. I mean, like it just it's more open system. You can just join the community and then I mean try to influence the community, like do the things you think that's right. So I think that's also very important. Yeah. I'm I'm definitely looking forward to seeing what gets added as I think no one has really nailed uh, sort of tokenizing stocks and tokenizing other assets on a DeFi platform yet where, where they've done it it hasn't really been rolled out in a big way it's all still sort of test cases at this point so i'm looking forward to seeing what your uh, community ends up adding and speaking of that uh let's talk about the token the perp token uh what what is the the basic function of it so yeah like we said um you can use for voting, so it's it's a governance token. So people, I mean, uh, if you are interested in joining the community, joining the voting process, you sh you definitely should get some perp token, so you can vote. Yeah, so that's one usage. The second thing is skating. Um, so uh, in our design, um, there is an insurance farm. I mean, uh, most of the I mean, leverage part that you have the insurance farm because uh, when the pie smooth. I mean, very fast, it flushes a lot. Actually, it might incur some loss to the, to the platform. There might be bad debt because we are not able to liquidate asset fast enough. So insurance fund kind of like cover those bad debt. But at the same time, you also charge a liquidation fee from the, I mean, from the trader who got liquidated. So, um, so we have this insurance fund, but they do have like some situation, the fund might get depleted. You know, maybe there's really a huge crash, I don't know. 
But once it got depleted, I mean, we will start, I mean, like make more tokens or like sell the tokens from Skaker. So Skaker actually kind of like become the last line of defense to the protocol. We kind of like secure the protocol. But, uh, uh, but because they do this, they actually got a piece of the um, a staking reward, also the transaction fees. So right now, I mean, like we are taking like 0.1% for all the transactions uh, as the fees. Mm -hmm. So if you skate, I mean, of course, in normal time, I think it, there is no, no such risk that, that I mentioned that the insurance fund got depleted. So you actually earn fees, also the skate, the skating rewards. Um, right now, we we don't really we don't share the fees because we want to we actually redirect all the fees to the insurance fund. But I think, but in the future, we will start. I mean, like share the fees to the stakers. Okay, so there's still a significant risk then for the stakers that in the event of a mass liquidation event, their tokens could get. Uh, I guess, recalled by the protocol to pay for traders on the platform. Yeah, yeah. That's, uh, but uh, it hasn't happened, ha it never happened. So yeah. uh, I think is. I mean, like, uh, so I think right now our approach is like we want to have more, I mean, like we just try to f put in more fees into insurance fund. So we can have a very healthy insurance fund first. Then, you know, it, it, it definitely will dec decrease the probability that uh, the mass, like, um, I mean, the, the insurance fund got such this kind of problem. So you don't really, I mean, we want to protect the staker. So I guess there would have been a pretty good uh, test case recently, which would have been uh, what's now being called, I think, Black Wednesday, which was the uh, the crash in, in late to mid-May. How did uh, the protocol hold up during that event? Because that would have been a, obviously a mass liquidation event for a lot of people. Yes, uh, actually, I, we are doing pretty well at that time. I think we actually, I mean, there is one day we got like 400 to 500 million of trading volume. Mm -hmm. Consider that we only launched like uh, six months ago. So it's quite a lot of trading volume. And uh, like I said, when the price actually fluctuated a lot, the insurance fund might have risk. But to be honest, at that time, because the trading volume is so high, we actually got more fees and then insurance fund actually goes way up. Okay. So it actually doubled. So, I mean, there you go. it's just like, in theory, there are like this kind of risk, but uh, in reality, I mean, it's only once. I mean, you know, you would probably need, you probably need like several years to prove that uh, the risk is actually minimal, but uh, I guess for the past month, the insurance fund actually doubled. So essentially what happened in, in that case was that there was so much volatility that the trading fees outweighed what was getting withdrawn from the, the insurance fund. And over time, that should help really create that buffer, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's true. So that's what happened. So. Okay. And so the um, last thing I just want to touch on, what is the token uh, like supply schedule for PERP? So obviously, new PERP might get minted if the um, insurance fund depletes. Uh, have you got any other plans to print new tokens or is it a fixed supply? How does that work? Um, so it's kind of a fix for now. So we have like 150 million tokens, I mean, uh, on schedule. So it's got, so some of the tokens are still not basket. So like team token. So, uh, I mean, majority of team token is still locked in the lock wallet. Um, so uh, I think uh, I think for schedule we have like maybe around like fifty five percent of the token will be used for rewards. Mm -hmm. I think that's the major a majority part of that. And uh, the rewards, I, I mean, like I said, we have giving all uh, the skating rewards. So we just want to incentivize either your skater or your trader to trade on our platform and also like uh, you know uh, get token and then participate in the governance and also um, skating on our platform. Okay, cool. Mm -hmm. And so something that I wanted to ask you, and I kind of want to ask every uh, DeFi protocol, uh, this when I interview them, is uh, what, what are the, some of the challenges ahead for Perpetual Protocol? And do you see an inherent risk in um, the sort of 
legal gray area that a lot of DeFi protocols sort of live in. I know that you've stated that you uh, don't plan to service US customers, for instance, um, and I imagine that's got to do with the law there. Uh, so yeah, what, what are some of the change, challenges that you think your protocol and just DeFi protocols in general are facing at the moment? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, I, yeah, we, 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 we do block the US users. So uh, because I think, uh, I mean, for all the derivative is actually under, I mean, um, I mean um, so it's all regulated. It's not like um, the, the token itself. So derivative is more restricted. Uh, I I actually don't have a good answer for this. I mean, uh, it's it's. I mean, for us, we want to. I mean, personally, I think we. I mean, DeFi. I mean, like DeFi derivative are much better because it's it's like hundred percent transparent to all the you know user to the regulators yeah. to the teams. Yeah. I mean, um, so so it's um, if they have like um, I mean like maybe like questions about like uh, like anti money laundering or something like that, you can actually go in and take a look. I mean, like um, you know, do analysis on your own. I mean, um, it's open to everyone. I think this actually much is a system much better than central change or like traditional finance like counterparty. I'm just saying that uh, it probably take time for regulators to really learn the difference and then try to have a way to, you know, a different way to take a look at this kind of system. But uh, eventually I think that will be true in the future. So I'm still bullish, I mean, on, on the whole space, I think this is, I mean, um, personally, I think this is still like uh, much better because of 100% transparency. So hopefully like the regulators can really understand the potential of this and then try to set a, a, a kind of like a different rules than the central change or like traditional finance. Yeah, it's certainly a lot easier for a regulator to just go on Etherscan and have a look at the code than to audit a company and ask for a whole bunch of uh, records that, you know, half of them probably been shredded and that sort of stuff. You can see, you can see everything there on the blockchain. Um, so uh, other than trading focused apps, which is where most of DeFi is really heavily centered on at the moment, what do you think the next big sort of killer application will be? Like, you, you know, we've got the automated market maker that Uniswap brought to the scene. I feel like that was, you know, the killer app. What do you think the next thing is? I, I still feel that the, the trading app, I mean like the trade and different protocols, maybe not apps, but the skill trading is a big part of the killer app. But uh, I think as we grow like to a mature DeFi system, like us, we are working like derivative. We are working perpetual protocol. I mean, perpetual contract is actually the uh, the most easier one. I think they are like the more complex one, like interest rate swap. You know, they are like uh, options that more like the complex uh, derivative that can be built. But personally, I think the key to help will be uh, there. There will be some other team that can really simplify all these concepts and then make a really simple idea like Yen. Yen actually did a really good example that you know you just like pick the vote that you want to put in and then you just click on that button and then you I mean you earned the yield. I think I mean why I'm saying this is that actually on the derivative space actually I mean in traditional finance is traded by I mean institutional traders. So they actually got a lot of profit, but the retail cannot access. Yeah. I really hope that someone can really, I mean, I, 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 I might not be the right guy. <laughs> I mean, like, uh, I, I, you know, I'm not really a, like a, a guy good at uh, simplified things, but I do believe that there are some teams like you're like maybe I, like Zappo, Depper actually can simplify all these con you know, very concept a very complex concept, like uh, you, I mean, like um, like like basic trade, like uh, funding rate arbitrage, and then make a really simple product, and then provide the retail. Yeah, I think that's a good point. The the killer application is bringing all these things to the retail market, um, so that people like me with no real 
background in you know that institutional level finance uh, can reap the rewards, um, can be exposed to this, and you know can put my money to work, uh, which previously was just not available to uh, to myself and most people on the planet. <laughs> yeah, that that's something I really hope that people can really build that out, and then uh, you know lots of people can use that. And uh, lastly, is there any uh, news about Perpetual Protocol that you'd like to share with our audience today? Yeah, sure. So uh, I think uh, we we actually, I think the recent trading volume is quite good. So I think we are in a stage that uh, uh, try to like, like put like more, put up more markets. So it's like um, if uh, people, I mean, uh, any people who are interested in perpetual trading, I mean, definitely will come to give you a try. And uh, we also work, are working on the V2, like, uh, which is a major update to our protocol. So hopefully that they can provide more capital efficient. And also uh, we want to have like any order. I mean, right now, most of the AM, we don't have any order, but uh, I do want to have like kind of like native give me order built into the AM itself. So I think that's definitely something we're, we're working on and hopefully we can launch it soon. Okay, awesome. And you, you mentioned uh, introducing more markets. Any in particular? No, I, I mean, like, we just launched a market that community wants. So yeah. if you have anything in mind, just go to our forum and then just post it. Yeah. Excellent. Well, you heard it there, folks. If you want to get involved in Perpetual Protocol, get, get some perp tokens and start participating in that uh, governance and get the uh, markets that you want to see up there. Uh, much easier process than trying to get Binance on the phone and tell them uh, what to list. I can tell you that. Uh, so thank you very much for your time, Yanwen. It was great to talk to you and I uh, hope everything goes well. And thanks for your time today. Yeah, nice talking to you as well. Yeah, cool. Yeah, take care.